Now the title of my sermon this morning is Chasten of the Lord. Chasten of the Lord. So I want to give you some motivation this morning uh, to make sure that you are serving the Lord and uh, keeping His commandments. Striving to keep His commandments and striving to serve the Lord. Now I don't know about you, but I don't know if you've ever had to discipline somebody before. Have you ever had to discipline somebody? You know, maybe you don't have kids. Or maybe you've had to discipline somebody at work. Maybe you've had to tell them off. Maybe you had to have a one-on-one. -on -one. You know, that's what they call them in the corporate world. You're going to have a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> well, one-on-ones are normally when you do your performance review and whatnot. But usually one-on-ones is when you need to be pulled up for things that you haven't been doing right. Or you are commended for things you're, that you're doing well. Same with children. You may have to discipline your children. If they're not behaving, if they're not keeping your commandments, right? If they're not doing what you ask, you may have to discipline them. Now, if you've ever had to discipline somebody before, obviously it's not pleasant for the one getting disciplined, but neither is it pleasant for the one doing the discipline. Right? The one that has to do the discipline. If you had to discipline somebody before, you know, it's not a pleasant experience. It's not something you look forward to. It's not something that you desire to do. And in fact, when you think about disciplining somebody, generally you think about, like, man, I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish they just did things the right way, for the right reason, had the right attitude, just did what they know what they should be doing. But because they refuse to do the right thing, because they refuse to walk in the right ways, you have no choice but to discipline them. So like we have that thought when it comes to discipline, I'm sure God has a similar thought, where He's patient with us. He, he, he wants to encourage us to do things for the right reasons, but sometimes when push comes to shove, He has no other choice but to get your attention. And that's what we're talking about today, is ways that God can get your attention uh, if you will not serve Him for the right reasons. So this is why we're talking about the chastening of the Lord. First thing I want to talk about is motivation. Because really, whilst we can be motivated by, cha by a chastening, by a discipline from the Lord, that ought not be our primary motivator. You know, if we're serving God always just out of fear, you know, or what, what other people think, this is not the motivation we ought to have to serve God. What should be our right motivation? Our right motivation should be out of gratitude should be out of love. You know, the reason why, and this is what lasts, you know, because generally if you're only doing things because you're getting disciplined, you're not going to last because you yourself do not want to do them. Right? But sometimes to get people moving, we need to, we need to discipline them. What should be the real reason why you serve God? Well, the re real reason why you should serve God is out of love. Right? Love is the primary motivator. It should be the right motivator. See, if you have a healthy spiritual life, you have a strong, if you are spiritually mature, the motivation, what motivates you to get up early on Sunday morning and come on time to church, right? What motivates you to go soul winning? What motivates you to open your Bible and think, what is God going to tell me today? What motivates you to want to pray for others, believing that your prayers actually make a difference in people's lives? It's love. That's the primary motivator. First John 4, look, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Now, what we've got to remember is this fear. What is this fear talking about? This fear is either fear of man or fear of going to hell. Because there is a fear, like we read in Hebrews just before, there is something we ought to fear, and that fear, you know, does come with love. You know, that, that right fear, that godly reverence of God. So this fear is talking about a different type of fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that, hath, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him, look at this, because he first loved us so the reason why we love god ought to be because he loved us first and honestly if you think about the things that god has done for you that ought to motivate you to serve him and oftentimes people are not motivated by love because they don't spend enough time considering what jesus christ did for them but not only not only what jesus christ did for us i mean this is romans 5 
You know, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. So what is he saying? It's rare that somebody will die for a righteous man. And really this second sentence is kind of saying the similar thing, right? It's kind of like reiterating that same point. Peradventure, it's like, you know, how many occasions are there or how many uh, times is there for a, good, for a good man, some would even dare to die. So that's what it's saying. Like, how rare is it that if somebody is good and righteous, that you will want to give up your life for them? And then, then it goes to verse 8, which is the one we're very familiar with. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you see how Jesus died for you, not because you were worthy, not because you deserved it. In fact, you were an enemy of God. You know, you were living in your sin, in your filthy rags, and that's when Jesus went to the cross. He died for you, in that while we were yet sinners. And the amazing thing is that we're still that sinner after we get saved, right? So sometimes we think, oh, you know, I'm cleaning up my life, you know, now I'm in the love of God. But what you don't realize is, you know, you still, you still haven't cleaned up your life, as you should, and yet God still loves you. This is the love that you have to dwell on and think about. That ought to motivate you and think, man, God is worthy of my service. My service to God is reasonable because of what God has done for me. We need to constantly reflect on that. But not only salvation, because sometimes the intangible, it's hard to walk by faith and value the intangible. But you can think also of the tangible things that God has blessed you with. Man, think about our health. Think about the fact that you could even come today. Amen. Think about the fact you didn't have to walk here. Yeah. You drove here. Or somebody drove you here. You know, you got, clothes, you got nice, clean clothes on your back. You know, you got appliances at home that people in third world countries, they, man, they wish. I remember when we first, you know, when we lived in Mexico, we didn't have a washing machine. Elizabeth used that, you know, that stone sink with the, with the ribs in it. And it's funny because Elizabeth, was, she, was, she was so used to like that sort of lifestyle because when she grew up, it was kind of a bit of a poor lifestyle. Sorry, I'm sharing your stories here. <laughs> but she's telling, she always tells me these stories about how to, to heat up a bath, they'd have to like light actual like wood to heat up the water, go get the, get the water from the well kind of thing. And... Um, I remember when we first got married, she's like, oh, why do you need to, you know, why do you need it, like a dishwasher, you know, just wash everything by hand, you know, it's like, why do you need, uh, you know, oh, you know, just, you don't need warm showers, just, just wash cold, just get in there and wash really quick. Now it's like, man, dishwasher is like, can't leave. now when the dishwasher breaks down, it's like, man, get somebody out of here quick, you know, got to fix it, and like, you know, it's taking long, warm showers. But I'm not, I'm not having a go at it, I'm just saying like, you know, this is what we're like, all of us in the Christian life, aren't we? We just take for granted the things that we have and we don't realise, this is what James 1 says, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So every time you sit down and you think, man, isn't life good? Or you enjoy something and you think, man, this is great, how blessed I am. Don't you forget who it comes from. But the reason why we have this is because of God. You know, the one, you know the one that you don't think about, that you neglect, that you, you, know, you, you, you don't get involved, you don't serve Him at all? That God. That's the God that blesses us daily, gives us things. And that's the God that we neglect. That's the God we don't prioritize. Man, He's so much more worthy of more from us. 1 John 5. So how do we know that we're loving God? Is it just a feeling? Is it just like, man, I'm just so infatuated with God and it's just like, I just get this feeling come over me and it's like, oh, I feel all warm and fuzzy. Is that when you know you love God? No, look at what it says here in 1 John 5. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not grievous. You see, it takes a while to get to that point, doesn't it, in your spiritual life? where you love God enough, where you actually desire to serve God. It's not a burden for you anymore. It's when you actually enjoy it. That, that's what for, gives you fulfillment. Like Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. You know, that's the, what we're striving for. You know? None of us can perfectly arrive there, but this is the standard. The standard is 
you know you love God when you want to keep his commandments. And when you walk in the spirit, that's the desire you'll have. See, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. What does that mean? They're not a burden to do. See, if you go, oh man, do I have... See, somebody who doesn't love God says, oh, I have to go to church every week. But somebody that loves God says, man, I get to go to church every week. You see the difference? Now, 1 Corinthians 9, we see here that we want to have the right motivation. Right? If we have the right motivation, we love God, that's the right way to do it. But unfortunately, like what we're talking about today, if that's not enough to motivate you, God has to employ some other tactics sometimes. <laughs> and it's like with parenting. You know, being nice, asking your kids nicely to do it, repeating yourself many times, being patient with them is not enough, then you've got to step up the chastening, right? So then we'll have an attitude like Paul. Think of it, this, uh, and this is obviously Paul talking about the gospel, but look at what he says here when he talks about preaching the gospel. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispossession of the gospel is committed unto me. So you see there how Paul is saying, man, if I do what I should be doing, and I do it willingly, then I'll be rewarded. But you know what? Even if I'm not rewarded, I don't want to do it, I'm commanded to do it anyway. And that's why he says, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. That's the sort of attitude that we've got to have, is we have to realize, hey, you know, you're commanded to do it anyway. God's going to make you do it. But you ought to be willing to do it. If you, if, you're, if you do it willingly, then you'll be rewarded for it. If you do it unwillingly, then you're just going to get chastised, right, to do it anyway. Philippians 2, last one in terms of this topic of motivation, being motivated by love. And obviously, we're not motivated by love. God has to employ other tactics. Philippians 2, look at this. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, a lot of people think this passage is talking about figuring out your salvation because that's how we use the term. Work it, work, if you work out something, it's kind of like you've got to figure it out. Right? So that's why when we read this passage, we think it means man, figure, figure out your salvation. And if you're, unsure, you know, if you're unsure, you should have some fear and trembling, which is... How some people interpret what I think it's saying here is it's basically an exhortation to add works to your salvation. You know, like make sure if you're saved, make sure you add works. Kind of like in, in James 2, you know, faith without works is dead. But why with fear and trembling? Why should we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Because just, just because we don't fear hell anymore, that doesn't mean there's nothing to fear anymore. What we ought to fear is God's chastisement. Right, so this is what we ought to fear, and this is what I want to talk about this morning. Now, before I get, well, when I get into the different ways God chastises us, the first thing I want to address is a way God doesn't chastise us, that people think God chastises us this way. And this is with curses. So some people, they misunderstand the Old Testament blessing and curses, and they think that it still applies to the New Testament. And they think if I'm disobedient to God, I'm going to be cursed. I'm going to have a curse on me and this is why things are going wrong and whatnot. Now things may be going wrong. Don't get me wrong. You know, think God can make things happen to your life. But it's not because of the curse and the blessing of the Old Testament. Of the, of the, of the Old Testament blessing and cursing. Now in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 11, there is a blessing and a curse. This is what the Old Covenant is. This is why it's called the Old Testament. Generally, when we think of Old Testament, New Testament, we think of a timeline, right? We think of what happened before Jesus and what happens after Jesus. And it's not necessarily wrong, in a sense, because that's when the New Testament comes into, a, into effect. But when Jesus came, remember, he was still living under the Old Testament. So even though you have New Testament passages, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there is a period of time where it's still the Old Testament, right? Because up until Jesus dies and rises again, the New Testament didn't come into effect. And we see like the changes to the law and things like that. But really, what, when you think of the Old Testament and New Testament, 
they go by the words old covenant and new covenant as well so what is the old covenant the old covenant is the covenant of work salvation it's the obey god you'll be blessed disobey god and you'll be cursed the new covenant is 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 replacing that because it's impossible to keep the old covenant so that's why a new covenant exists and the new covenant is by faith it's grace through faith so that's why and i i talk about this a lot and this is why people get so mixed up with work salvation because what why why is it so hard to defend against work salvation because the passages are there why are they there because the old covenant is something that actually exists it's something that's actually in the bible in the sense that you need to obey and you'll be blessed and if you do this this is why when jesus is teaching as well sometimes he's teaching the jews in 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 relation in in context of the old covenant and this is why he talks about you know if you hate your brother you know if you hate somebody without a cause you'll be in danger of hellfire because he's also teaching in terms of old testament laws and this is when if you don't understand the new covenant people misinterpret those old covenant passages or things that are alluding to the old covenant and this is why you know do you want verses for work salvation they're there but if people actually want to believe work salvation good luck to them being perfect right so this is sometimes why i explain to people at the door there are two ways to go to heaven one is you keep the old covenant right and you got to live by them and you got to keep the whole law right right you you're fallen from grace you, you you actually have to keep that whole law that's one way to get saved the problem is it's impossible the other way to get saved is the new covenant it's by grace through faith deuteronomy 11 behold i set before you this day a blessing and a curse a blessing if you obey the commandments of the lord your god which i command you this day and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the lord your god but turn aside out of the way which i command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known so you see here that is the blessing and the curse of the old covenant they had to keep the commandments of the lord in order to receive this blessing now let me ask you you got to keep the commandments of the lord so how good do you need to be if you think the blessing and the cursing still happen in the new testament well then how good do you need to be to be blessed you have to keep all the commandments right because this is this is what he's saying you got to keep the commandments in order to be blessed so how many commandments do you need to break to then be cursed to not be keeping the commandments just one right so you see how it's impossible to be blessed and cursed based on your works it's like salvation if you can't earn salvation by works like if salvation was by works who can be saved so it's the same with this blessing and cursing if you think this is how god operates in the new testament if god only blesses those who are obedient then who can be blessed because nobody is blessed by because of their works because you know nobody can keep all the commandments so when it comes to the new testament it's different we have rewards we have chastisement this is different right it's a different type of relationship why, why is it different because when people think see the blessing and the, cur the curses of god are god's you know obviously we know what the blessings are but the cursing involves god's anger god's hatred god's contempt god's indignation and this is why in the new testament the, the the real blessing and cursing is the new heaven and new earth and and hell right because this is what this is prophesying of and, and how it was applied to the nation of israel was just a picture for us of how god deals with people and deals with nations in the new testament so this is the picture we're getting in the old testament and what the old covenant represents because nobody could ever keep this no that's why nobody was ever saved by works this whole idea of dispensationalism where people before jesus were saved by works if that was the case then nobody could be saved by works because nobody's justified by the law that's why noah found grace in the eyes of the lord abraham believed god it was counted for him for righteousness everybody who has ever been saved was always saved by grace through faith but we have this picture that god implemented because it's teaching us spiritual lessons in the new testament so if we are only blessed because of our obedience then nobody can be blessed because then being blessed by god would require perfection now the problem with this, the the difference between a curse of god and a chastisement of god is the relationship difference and you may think oh victor aren't you just splitting hairs no because it makes a huge difference in your spiritual life right because when you disobey god 
What you need to realize is when you're chastised of God, God still loves you. God hasn't given up on you. You know, God is trying to correct you because he wants you to live a, a more righteous life. But when you read, if you think it's a curse, and then you go and read all the passages about God cursing you and he's forsaking you and he's angry with you and he hates you, and you see how that's going to change how you think of God? Whereas when you know God loves you, when you're chastised, that'll motivate you to try again. But when you think God ha hates you and he's given up on you, you know what that does to people? It discourages them. And you're like, you know what? There's no even, even point in trying because I, I can't be perfect anyway. I'll never have, be in God's good graces. But when you know, man, it's not my works that gets me in God's good graces. God is just trying to correct me like a loving parent. It's not changing my relationship with him. Then that changes how you see yourself and how you see God when you inevitably will sin. Right? Sometimes we willfully sin. Sometimes, I mean, every sin is willful. But sometimes we, we struggle. Sometimes we dive into it, right? And other times we try and resist it and go into it. But you know that inevitably you'll sin. And you want to have the right perspective in how God sees it and how your relationship with God is. So attaining salvation by works leaves you hopeless. If you only have a good relationship with God or you think God only loves you because of your works, that's going to leave you hopeless as well. So we need to understand that there are two covenants, old covenant and new covenant. Salvation, well, you know, works and grace. And it's alluded to here in Romans 10. Romans 10, brethren, this is Paul uh, through the Holy Spirit writing about the nation of Israel, the physical nation, right? My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear the record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Right? So they were excited about the things of God, but they didn't know the right things. And we don't want to be like that as Christians either. We don't want to be zealous you know, for the things of God and not be knowledgeable. I think our church maybe has the other, other problem. Right? Our problem is we, we know too much, but we're not zealous enough. We're like the opposite. Right? So we need, to, we need to get both. Right? We need to have a zeal of God, and we had to have it according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So you see how there are two ways to get righteousness. One is you try and establish your own righteousness, which we know is impossible to be perfect. The other way is you submit yourself to the righteousness of God. And what is that? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. See, see this is how you get your own righteousness is by the law. But because it's impossible, you need to submit yourself to the righteousness of God. How do you do that? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, this is works, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Right? So if you're going to get life by the law, that's how you've got to get it. It's one or the other. But the righteousness which is of faith, speaketh on this wise, say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So that's why you believe unto righteousness, right? Because that's the righteousness of God, which is by faith, as opposed to establishing your own righteousness by the law of Moses. Now, the blessing and cursing in the Old Testament, it's funny because it's, it's, it's misapplied today by, by, by New Testament believers, right? Because, and, and we're critical of New Testament, we're critical of you know the Pentecostal charismatic new age or like these new contemporary preachers that misapply the blessings in the Old Testament where do you think they're getting the passages where they say well if you serve God you're gonna be blessed and your business is gonna be blessed and everything's gonna be great they're getting them from these Old Testament passages that if you obey the commandments of the Lord you walk in his ways you're going to be blessed now we we cringe when they misapply those verses and apply them physically, right? And say, ah, oh, you know, your physical life is going to be affected, you know, or going to be blessed 
because of how you obey the Lord. But yet we'll listen to a fundamentalist preacher who then says, hey, if you disobey God, you're cursed, and that's fine. So, so they think it's okay to say, hey, you're cursed for disobeying God, but then we, 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 um, we criticise the Pentecostal preacher, we, we criticise the, the, uh, the new preacher, the prosperity preacher today, for saying, well, if you obey God, you'll be blessed. And this is why it's funny, because when you hear fundamentalist preachers today preach on this doctrine of blessing and cursing, they struggle to be consistent because they want to come down hard that, hey, if you're not obeying God, hey, the curse is going to come. You're going to get, you know, God's angry with you every day, you know, and you're not living up to God's standard. But then when you're serving God faithfully and your life's not going well, they're like, yeah, well, you know, God's not always, you know, that doesn't always work like that in the New Testament. But, you know, hey, does this, does this, does a blessing and curse apply or not? Right? Because if it always applies when you're disobedient, but it only sometimes applies when you're obedient. You know, whereas the, the prosperity preachers are saying, hey, it should always apply when you're obedient, and you're not blessed, and maybe you're not being obedient enough, but then they never talk about the cursing. Right? So it's just funny how you see those two sides of the coin. But if you're consistent, you know that this is, it's, it's not right, the right way to understand this. Because it leaves you with questions. You know, why are there so many godly believers trying to serve the Lord faithfully? but everything is going bad for them. Why are there ungodly believers who don't seem to care about serving the Lord, but everything is going well for them? Because, like I said, it's not about blessing and cursing anymore. It is rewards and chastisement. So a false understanding of this blessing and cursing doctrine will end up leaving you to two conclusions. Either it'll just make you give up because you'll never be good enough to earn God's blessings, or you'll be just so deluded or hypocritical that you think you're good enough to be earning God's blessings when you, know, you just happen to be blessed by God, just, uh, you just happen to be you know, blessed, blessed by God just out of his grace, right? not out of anything you do. Or you're just reaping what you've sown. Like if you've worked hard, you may have an easy life as opposed to somebody who is lazy, not taking care of themselves. So how do we understand why, why does the blessing and curse no longer apply in the New Testament? Well, look at Galatians 3. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in, look at this, in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Right? So if you're of the works of the law, which is that you're trying to earn salvation by works, you're not saved, you're under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things. See, this is why one lie cannot enter into heaven. One lie makes you deserving of hell. One lie, and if you trust your works, you don't have salvation, which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. So you see the two differences there? The law, works of the law, and grace by, through faith but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. So this curse that is mentioned in Deuteronomy 11, the old covenant, that is what we're being saved from. Right? So why would God still be cursing us when Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law? There's no more curses for God to give you because he's completely cursed Christ for the sins that you've committed. Remember, past, present, and future? You know, have we forgotten that we, we, we are saved not only from our past sins, from our future sins? So how then can we get a curse from God for our future sins when Christ was cursed for us? Redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. I don't know if you know that, but in the Old Testament there is a law, I think it's at the end of Exodus 21 off the top of my head, that says if, you, if somebody is killed um, for a crime you know, and they're hung on a tree, you have, to, you have to bury them. They have to be buried and taken off that tree. So that's Christ fulfilling that law as well. That the blessing, look at this, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive this promise of the Spirit through faith. So you see that the Old Testament blessing and cursing is fulfilled by hell being the curse, which is what Christ took for us, and then the blessing, which is the promises of God 
to, the, to Israel, which is the true Israel, right? So that's why these promises given to the nation of Israel are a foreshadow of things to come. The true nation of Israel is the believers, and those blessings are given to us by those who receive it by faith. That's why, you know, you are Abraham's seed. If, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that's where people get this whole Zionism mixed up, right? Where they read the Old Testament. So just like people mix up this Old Testament blessing and cursing and misunderstand it, misapply it in the New Testament, that's how people get stuck into Zionism, where it's just like they just think just because a physical nation is called Israel and they give God lip service and they say they're Jews, you know, like, the, like Revelation says, the people that say they are Jews and are not, right? Instead are the synagogue of Satan because they reject Jesus Christ, they are of Antichrist. But people look at that nation and then read the blessings in the Old Testament given to the nation and think that God is applying it to them. No, no, it's applying to us, right? Those who are believers and now of the, of the commonwealth of Israel, as we read in Ephesians 2, those blessings are to us because of faith. And obviously, Jews who believe on Jesus Christ also partake in those promises because they are still part of that spiritual nation and we all come together as one nation spiritually. So you see there's the blessing and cursing. Uh, God dealt with Israel. If you think about it, in the Old Testament you see both because if nobody kept the Old Covenant, why was God so good to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament? Well, it's because both pictures are there. Right? So even though, that's why, remember when I told you in the New Testament, you still have allusions to the Old Testament because Jesus was still in the Old Testament. Well, in the Old Testament, you have allusions to the New Covenant too. Why do you think David sings of God's mercy and his mercy endureth forever? And you, know, you have Noah and Abraham and you have the nation of Israel. Even though they complain and complain, God still does good for them. So not only is God showing us a picture and dealing with Israel as unbelievers and rejecting him and dealing with other nations, He's also showing us pictures of Israel as his people in the New Testament and how he blesses them. And this is why people get confused, right? Because that's why, that's why the Old Testament has to, be writ, has to be read through the lens of the New Testament. Because if you just read the Old Testament and just try and understand it without the New Testament, there's a lot in there. That's why the Bible says they see through a glass darkly in the Old Testament. You need to understand the Old Testament based on what has been revealed in the New Testament. A look here, Psalm 118. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. So that's the difference between blessing and cursing and the chastisement of God. Right? So we talked about what should motivate us, love. Now, if that doesn't motivate us, God is going to chastise us. But one thing he doesn't chastise us with is not this blessing and cursing. That is something that has been fulfilled in Christ, done away with in Christ. Christ took our cursing, right? We have the blessing because of our faith. But what's left? God can chastise us, right? And just like we chastise our children, it's not pleasant. How does Hebrews 12 explain it? This is where we started, Hebrews 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, I don't know about you, but a scourging already is not pleasant. I think as well he's talking in Hebrews 12 because remember in Hebrews he's talking about the, the early Jews like suffering for their faith, suffering for the cause of Christ. And sometimes God would allow, God, God like, like he's not the one that you know, instigates the, tribula the, tr the tribulation and persecution that believers go through, but why does he allow sometimes believers to go through persecution and tribulation? It's not always, it always molds us, but sometimes he, he allows it as a way to chastise people. You know, as a way, if they're not living for God, then the tribulation and the persecution can come. So as we think through these different things, that does this really need to happen to you before you decide to serve God? I mean, does God seriously need to get somebody to literally beat you up, physically scourge you for the cause of Christ, for being a Christian, for you to take your faith seriously? Is that what it's going to take? So scourging is not pleasant. So just think about the other things God could do to scourge you. We're going to look in the passage of Job, because Job is a great example of things that God is capable of allowing to happen to you or doing to you directly. Job 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, 
one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, first of all, look at how Job is praised. And this was allowed to happen to him. Now, think about if you willingly disobey God again and again, week after week, knowing that you should be doing what you should be doing in terms of living the Christian life in prayer, soul winning, reading your Bible, attending church faithfully, serving at church, and week after week you don't do that, what might God do to you? Right, and this is a true fear that we should have. You know, this is not just like, oh, you know, Victor's just trying to scare us into doing it. I am trying to scare you into doing things because this is how we ought to fear God. You know, because I think we take God for granted. And like I talked about in the beginning, you don't want to chastise somebody. You may be patient with them, give them some time to grow, give them some time to do what's right. But you know what? One time, it, you may run out of time. And you, you, it's not that you're going to go to hell because Christ has taken the curse for us. But you know, chastisement may be coming in your life. And I don't want it to happen to you to get, you know, do these things have to happen to you for God to get your attention? You know, isn't God's love and his word enough to get your attention? But for some people, it's not. And unfortunately, for those people, it's not. Sometimes God has to bring some suffering into their lives. He has to bring some tribulation and persecution. He has to bring some illness, maybe, some things into your life to get your attention. And we've seen it happen countless times, haven't we? And when things are going all great, people forget God. When things are going all smooth, man, everything's how you're busy, aren't you? Too busy for God. And then God has to stop you. He has to get your attention. Maybe something has to happen until you go, oh man, I better get back to God. I better get back to, you know, because when things are going rough, that's when people, you see them at church again. Because yeah, they think, oh man, I better get... And sometimes they're, sometimes they're doing it for the wrong reasons, right? Because they're thinking this whole blessing and cursing thing. They're like, oh man, God's cursing me. I better get back to church so my life will get better. But, you know, it's just the chastisement of God. So if this sort of thing's happened to Job, and we're going to read about it in a moment, I mean, what might happen to us who are not perfect, not upright, one that doesn't fear God, doesn't assure evil? And they were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. So this is his family. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household. You'll notice later that this very great household refers to his employees, right? His servants, the people that in the Old Testament, obviously it's okay to own people, right? Nowadays, we have employees, right? Where you kind of sell half your time to somebody rather than your whole time. So that this man was the greatest of all men of the East. So he was a very prosperous person. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Man, this is a great passage for for parents. What an example of Job that, you know, even when his sons are grown up and he's still praying for his children, still praying. You know, maybe they've done something wrong and he's like asking God to forgive them on their behalf. But you can see the heart that Job has for his children, that he wants them to live godly. Let's skip down to verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking. We're skipping over because if you're familiar with the story of Job, obviously there is that encounter with Satan and God about, hey, look at my servant Job and whatnot. So I'm just skipping over that because I want to get to the things that actually affected Job. There was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house and there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. So remember at the beginning of the chapter, we're told of his riches. So if you can imagine that what did God allow to happen to Job to get Job's attention, right? To mold Job. Is he lost material possessions. And we see that, you know, it might, you know you, your business might go bust. You might lose your job. You know, your investments might go wherever. But you may lose all that money that you trust so much in to keep you and what has kept you away from God, right? Sometimes people have too much money, they have too much time to go here and travel there and everything's always happening on the weekend. Things are always happening when church events are on. Things are always happening and you can't go soul winning because you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Well, one day, that all, that all might be God for God to get, get your attention. 
And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they've slain the servants with the edge of the sword. So not only did he lose his cattle and his sheep, oh, what did he lose? His asses and his oxen, but also he lost his employees as well, his servants, with the edge of the sword. And I only have escaped alone to tell thee. Whilst he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven. So what's interesting there is that the servant thinks that it's coming from God, but it's actually Satan doing this. And hath burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So again, we see this loss of material wealth. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So that's why when I think of the material wealth, I kind of think of like your, your, your investments, right? And then the servants, it's like your business, you know, when people's businesses go under and they, you know, they find themselves on the street or something like that. I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, and this is the sad one, thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. So again, see, they don't know that Satan and God is behind this, right? That they've done this deal. And they just think, a great wind from the wilderness. So what is this service saying? Oh, Mother Nature just came and took them away, right? Smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So not only do we see the loss of material wealth, we see the loss of maybe a business. We also see the loss of close family, friends and loved ones, right? That may affect people to get your attention. You know, and that, that can happen. You know, just like here, you might say, well, why wasn't God merciful to the children? Well, you know, people are living on all different timelines, you know? We don't know. I don't know. If you, I remember there was a movie once. I can't remember what it was called, but it was like everyone had a timer on top of their head and then you could see like when they were going to die. I can't remember what movie that was. I remember seeing some clip but something like that. Or it was like something on your arm and you could see when you were going to die. So everyone has different timelines. I mean, this is when their time was up. But see, God can work that into your life where somebody's time is up and that was somebody dear to you to get your attention, to remind you, hey, you shouldn't just be living for this life. You should be living for the things of God. But does God need to do... But see, this is what I want to ask you this morning. See, what I want, to, what I want you to think about this morning is does God really need to do that for you? For you to wake up? For him to get your attention? Like, do you really need this to happen to you? Whilst God is still being patient with you, you know? Then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. We'll skip over the next couple of verses because there's obviously another encounter with God and Satan. God, uh, Satan comes back to God and says all these things were done to Job. Still didn't curse God. Verse 7 in chapter 2. So went, Satan, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord. So this is now when God allows Job because before... Job was not, uh, God, Satan was not allowed to touch Job. That's why Satan took away everything else. But now Satan is allowed to touch Job, but he's not allowed to kill him. So it says this, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. So not only do we see here that now his health is being taken away, so whilst I know the context of Job is he's being tried, right? But like I said, if God allows something like this to happen to Job, what could he allow to happen to us who, are, who, who requires more chastisement than Job did? And this is why sometimes people have health problems. I'm not saying... This sermon is not to say that all our ills are because of our disobedience. But what I'm saying is it is possible, it's a possibility that God can chastise you for your disobedience. And these are things that God is more than well capable of, right? Taking away your health. This is why God gives us the power to get wealth, because the reason why you even have a sound mind, the reason why your body works the way it does, 
You know, sometimes you wonder when somebody's just so healthy and they're doing the right thing, but they're not serving God, they don't care about things of God, all of a sudden they just, something happens to them. They find out they have cancer or something like that. You know, could it be? You know, but let's, let's make sure that's not the case. Let's make sure our heart is right with God. We're trying to use our life to serve God so that this is, we can rule out this possibility. And we don't need God to come down on us like this to get our attention, take away our health. Look at this. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. What about relationship problems? Relationship problems God is capable of too. You know, look at what happened here where he put a strain in the family. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now you kind of think, Man, if Job had everything right, like what was God possibly trying to accomplish out of this? Obviously, it's to show us how we go through suffering, but there's a theory that the, the thing that Job struggled with, or the thing that was making him not perfect, and completely, right? Like he was, was his pride. Because if you remember, he's talking with his uh, friends throughout Job, but he gets to the point where he demands his day in court. He demands to be heard of God. And he's like saying, like, when I face God, I will do, I'll ask him, like, why are these things happening? Whatever. Done. And then when God speaks and gives him answers, gives and tell and talks to him, God never actually explains to him, Job, why he's doing all these things. Right? If you think about it, Job is saying, like, I, want to, I need to know. I need to see God. I need to demand my day in court. So God will explain to me like, why he's doing this stuff. God finally shows up. And does God tell Job why he's doing all these things? No, he just, tells, he just asks Job a bunch of questions. Where were you when I made the earth? Do you know this? Do you know that? So what was he trying to show Job? What was he trying to teach Job through all this? To trust him. That Job didn't know it. He didn't need to know all the answers. He didn't know, need to know what God was doing, but he just needed to trust that God had his best interests in mind. And because he had that attitude, pride was Job's problem. Right? To, to think that he could demand that day in court, and God never, he never gave him the answers. Just basically put him in his place. So you don't need to know. Do, you know. do you know as much as I know? No, you don't. So you just have to trust me. That's what God is saying to Job. And that's why when God ends his sort of Job 40 all the way to Job, uh, Job I think it's Job 40, uh, 40 and 41, when God is like asking Job questions, look at what he ends with when he talks about Leviathan. Job 41, 34, He beholdeth all high things. This is him talking about Leviathan. He is a king over all the children of pride. And remember, God is likening Leviathan to himself. He's saying, remember, when you can't stand before Leviathan, who can then stand before me? So that was Job's problem. That, and that is why in Job 42, Job says, Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So this is what God was finally trying to break down in Job. What I believe is that Job still had an element of pride, was not trusting God completely, and this suffering that he went through was a way for God to get that, change him and, and get that out of him. So God can definitely affect you financially, affect you materially, affect you relationally, right? Even your health, right? Health-wise, God can affect you. And like I said, if this sort of stuff happens to Job, what else could happen to us? Let's look at two other examples of things God can do to chastise us. 1 Corinthians 11. This is talking about the Lord's Supper and people are, um, what's the word, uh, not doing it properly, right? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So I know there are different theories on what it means to be unworthy. I'm not preaching about this in this sermon. But what I want to focus on is when people do do it unworthily, what is the chastisement that can come down on them? Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Look at this in verse 30. For this cause... So because people are not treating the Lord's Supper correctly, right? they're partaking what the Bible describes unworthily, it says, for this cause, many are weak 
and sickly among you. So you see how because of what they were doing, because of their sin in the New Testament, God actually caused health problems in the New Testament church. Do you need that in order to get your attention? Or would you rather just be motivated out of love and, and use God's graciousness and his patience with you to serve him? For many are weak and sickly among you. And look at this, and many sleep. Now that's not just saying people are tired. This is saying many sleep because people lose their lives. God takes your life for disobeying him. So we need to be aware of this, that we can disobey God to the point where God says, you know what, enough is enough, and you are removed from the earth. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So you see, if you think about how you're living your life and you focus on that, God doesn't need to do that job. See, right, if you do your job, which is to make sure you're focusing on serving God and you're prioritizing God, then God doesn't have to step in and do that for you and make sure that you're prioritizing God and make sure that you're thinking about Him. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord and we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together under condemnation and the rest will I set in order. Last one is the most famous one of God doing something in the church to cause fear in the church. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained... Was it not thine own, and after it was sold, what is it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Now it's interesting that whilst, what is their sin here, right? They've sold a piece of land. They kept back part of the price of the land. They gave the money to church, but what did they do? They told everyone that they gave it all. So if you think about it, the real principle of the sin here is they did something in order to look good in front of the church, but the truth of the matter is that they didn't actually do that. Right? But how often sometimes are we guilty of that? That we're not living how we ought. When people ask how your spiritual life is going, oh yeah, it's, it's going pretty good. You know, I'm going pretty good. You know, you try and keep up that appearance, right? But you're lying to the Holy Ghost. You know, so this is something that we should be convicted about too. Not just, hey man, yeah, if, I, if I ever sell a property, I'll just never own one, then I'll never be in this situation. <laughs> but you know, you sell a property and get, you know, you might say, well, I'll never be in that situation. But it's the fact that they are trying to show themselves as something at church that they're not. Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Right? So what did God do? God killed them for that. See, this is why the Bible says we ought to serve God with fear and trembling with reverence, because yes, whilst he's loving and he's patient, his patience may run out and he needs to chastise you out of love. And ways he can do that are ways that are pretty bad. Great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. I always find this passage funny because... Ananias dies. They can take him out to go bury him. So three hours later, which you can guess, that's probably taken the three hours to dig, you know, and bury him. And then they come back, and then like, and then Sapphira dies. So I just feel like it's funny because they're coming back, and then Peter knows. Look, the the men that buried your husband they just come back. Now they're going to bury you. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these. 
things. So, like I said, and that's what I want you to think about today, is these are the things that God can do to us. You know, he doesn't want, I don't think he wants to do these to us. You know, like a loving father, you know, I don't want to spank my children. I don't desire that. You know, I, oh, sometimes I feel like when I, they have to spank them, they're like, you brought me to this. Simon, you got me to this point. Like, you know, I didn't want to. I was like, I'm trying to ask you nicely, trying to get you to do things the right way. But it's like, now you've made the choice. You made the choice. You knew, you know this is how you get disciplined. You made the choice. And this is what it's like with God. You know how God, you know how God can operate. You know, so if in your heart you know you're just disobedient, God's prompting you, you just don't do it, you just continue to willfully sin, you just keep going, right? Just keep doing it. Don't be surprised when the chastisement comes. Right? Do you really need that in order for God to wake you up? So how do we know that we're fearing God? I just want to show you a couple of verses. Just read these to you and you'll get a good idea. Deuteronomy 5. Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. So I don't want you to just walk out here and just go, oh, I'm just shaking in my little boots, you know, fearing God. Now, how do you know you're actually fearing God? Well, you fear God when you keep his commandments. So that's why fear and love in the New Testament is sort of the same. I love God, I fear him, I keep his commandments. That's what we should be striving to do. I pray that God will not have to get your attention through chastisement in order for you to take the things of God seriously. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder this morning. God, I need this reminder as well. Lord, help us to fear you. We take you for granted, Lord. We just... You know, we just come to you when we need something. We come to you. We just treat you like a heavenly, you know, Santa Claus. You know, just come, you know, when we just write the things that we want. Lord, help us not to be like that. Help us to have reverence and godly fear. Lord, that we might take the things of you seriously. That, Lord, that we will be motivated by love so that we don't need to be motivated through fear of chastisement. Lord... You know, whatever needs to be done, I pray that it needs to be done. I pray that people will, will use their life to serve you. And Lord, if you need to get their attention, I pray that it is done. Because Lord, life is so short. And if you don't get their attention now, one day it might be too late. So we thank you, Lord, for your grace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.